Southern China is still suffering from massive flooding, but Chinese media is pushing propaganda. The Trump administration is reportedly discussing a travel ban against all Chinese Communist Party members. An analyst says the U.S. is in for a Cold War that might be harder than the one with the Soviet Union. The 10 prohibitions of Communist Party members' beliefs, this document stipulates what is and isn't acceptable for party members, including details of their personal lives. The U.S. Attorney General says 80 percent of U.S. economic espionage cases link back to China. He asks Americans to stand together and resist the CCP's attempts at further influence. And an investigation is underway into the risk posed by two Chinese social media companies. Both of them hold vast amounts of personal data from Americans, but are obliged to hand over their user data at the request of the Chinese regime. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. While flooding continues to wreak havoc on southern China, Chinese media outlets are pushing propaganda. Their reports only focus on the positive developments, like quick emergency response times and beautiful scenery, without covering the devastation. NTD's Juliet Song reports. China is grappling with its worst flooding in decades. So far, almost 90 percent of China's provinces have been affected, while over two million people have been forced to abandon their homes. But Chinese media outlets seem to be beautifying the disaster and toning down the devastation. In Jiangxi province, one of the worst hit by the floods, a resident previously told us that the situation there is really dire. We're in a very miserable situation. The embankments have burst and water is overflowing. Others are trapped in their homes without basic supplies. Now I don't have any food to eat. I don't even have any rice at home. What should I do? Both residents live near China's biggest freshwater lake, Poyang, and have suffered from its flooding. The day the lake's water level exceeded its flood warning level, state-run media Xinhua News Agency posted a video online. In it, the outlet said as the lake's water continues to climb, parts of the road have been submerged, adding that the most beautiful road above water emerged as a result. In early July, when Wuhan was hit by heavy rain and flooding, state media posted an article praising the city's scenery after the rain. One Chinese internet user wrote an article to express his shock at the media's attempts to put a positive spin on the disaster reports. He wrote, Our mainstream media is trying to create a beautiful world for us. In this world, the flood didn't damage any roads, crush any bridges or homes, or wash away any cars. A Hubei resident says he thinks it's one of Chinese media's characteristics. We've distorted his voice to protect his identity. They can put a so-called positive energy spin on anything bad. To use a popular idiom, they can turn a funeral into a joyous occasion. The Chinese Communist Party uses the phrase positive energy in its propaganda. It means to only focus on the bright side. According to the regime, crises, disasters, and criticizing the Communist Party would be deemed negative energy. If disaster hits, the propaganda will always focus on the victory and success of emergency management. They won't talk about the suffering. Mr. Leo said some Chinese people are very annoyed by the propaganda. But there isn't a way out. Right now, China doesn't have freedom of speech. Many people who work in the media may not want to send out the propaganda, but they have to because it's required by the regime. In 2017, Chinese leader Xi Jinping said state media outlets should spread and transmit positive energy. Another theme commonly seen in the so-called positive reporting is the use of drone shots. A senior Chinese media professional says they're used for a reason. In the article, he wrote, Pain doesn't have a place in shots like this. When flooding comes, it destroys homes, drowns pigs or people, and their bodies are left to rot. When the water recedes, it leaves garbage everywhere. These are some pretty bad scenes, but they won't appear in aerial shots. Chin Han and Juliet Song, NTD News. For nearly 50 days, Chinese leader Xi Jinping hasn't appeared in China's flood-affected areas. His absence has sparked questions online about his whereabouts. Admit the questions, a set of unusual photos went viral in China. The first picture shows a billboard that features Xi Jinping's photo, accompanied by two local officials during an inspection in the region.
The second picture shows three men wading through the waist-deep water as they try to rescue the poster attached to the billboard. The time and location of the incident couldn't be confirmed, but the text on the billboard indicates that it should have happened in central China's Hunan province. Similar situations are common in North Korea. According to North Korean media, in 2012, a 14-year-old student was killed in a flood while trying to rescue porches of former North Korean leaders. Now we talk about another meaning of the phrase made in China. Here's an example of what you'd call solid as iron. A more than 700-year-old Buddhist temple in Hubei province has survived the test of time. And it's still holding strong despite the current historic levels of flooding. Now we turn to China's economy. China's National Bureau of Statistics has released the country's GDP data for the second quarter. The report shows a year-on-year increase of 3.2 percent. But except for the GDP, most other important economic indicators fell. Electricity generation, the most important indicator of industrial production, fell by 1.4 percent in the first half of the year. Investment in fixed assets also fell 3.1 percent in that time. Retail sales saw a decline of 11.4 percent in that period. And in June alone, retail sales fell 1.8 percent. The odd situation has prompted questions about why the GDP is rising despite the bad performance of other economic indicators. Zhong Dajun, the director of Dajun Think Tank, an economic consulting company, told Radio Free Asia that disaster relief also increases the GDP. That's because large amounts of materials are transported and produced by various departments, which increase the GDP. The Chinese Communist Party has been working to strengthen its ideological control of its members. According to Bitter Winter magazine, party members in a northeast Chinese city received a document named the 10 Prohibitions of Communist Party Members' Beliefs back in May. The document stipulates what is and isn't acceptable for party members, including details of their personal lives. For example, it prohibits party members from being religious. Members are strictly forbidden from wearing or displaying anything related to religion at home or at work. They're also not allowed to visit places of worship outside of work, related reasons. Likewise, they're not allowed to during business trips, tourism opportunities or vacations for the purpose of participating in religious worship or asking for blessings in temples or churches. Even improving your moral character is forbidden if it's in the name of Buddhism or a god. One city in Tibet doesn't even allow party members to promise to quit gambling, smoking, drinking or killing in the name of a Buddha or God. According to Bitter Winter's report, six village officials who are also party members in a central Chinese city must self-criticize for donating money to build a temple last year. That's as a party member in northeastern Liaoning province was ordered to write a self-criticism reflection letter after she was caught saying, thank the Lord. Authorities also sent people to her home to destroy religious texts and paintings there. All religious believers in her neighborhood were also investigated. We recently reported on the CCP virus whistleblower Dr. Lee Meng Yen, who fled Hong Kong at great personal risk to expose the truth about the virus. We caught up with Sean Lin, former microbiologist with the U.S. Army. He had been requested to meet with her. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So you were requested to meet with Yen. What were your thoughts upon meeting her? So uh, after she escaped Hong Kong on April 29, 28, she arrived in the United States on the 29th. And then a few days later, and I was requested to have a dialogue with uh, a virology escaped from China. I didn't know who I was going to, I was going to meet. And uh, when I saw her, I was really surprised because she was so young and uh, I was expecting someone more senior than her, but uh, uh, definitely uh, I had quite a few hours uh, talking to her for the first time, and we discussed many aspects of her uh, studies, and she uh, definitely is a credible scientist uh, with uh, very well-grounded knowledge and skills in virology, molecular virology, immunology, and also uh, animal studies and medical uh, knowledge background. What work has she done that makes her seem credible to you? To me, she's obviously a, a very uh, well-grounded um, uh, 
very uh, talented uh, scientists and researchers. Uh, even in this year, she has several publications, including publication on the top journal, Nature, and also uh, she's a, a co-first author for the paper. Uh, in the paper, they actually established the first animal model for COVID-19 study. And so that definitely proved she's not just any ordinary like lab technicians. And she actually is the window there, her lab uh, communicate with many uh, counterparts in China. So she, she definitely has strong background and very credible. What's unique about the lab she worked at? <clears throat> so her lab in um, uh, public health school in University of Hong Kong was the WHO reference lab. And this is a very unique position. And they have um, several top uh, virologists in the in the institute, uh, including uh, Dr. Gabriel Leon, uh, Dr. Grant Yi, uh, um, and also her boss Leo Pong and Malik Paris. These are the top virologists in, even in the whole world, and and they have in a very unique connection because you know in, uh, the South China is a hotbed for many um, disease outbreak, and they are in Hong Kong. So they have strong collaboration with uh, Guangdong, Guangxi province. They are easy to collect samples uh, from mainland China and then do top-notch studies in the lab. What do you think is the importance of Yen stepping forward now? She, she definitely has a strong evidence that the uh, Chinese government is covering up the outbreak in Wuhan. And, and also she can see how the Chinese government treat the whistleblowers. And so she mentioned about the doctors in Wuhan, uh, not just in Wuhan, many doctors uh, quickly uh, silence when the government changed their tunes and also she mentioned about the uh, scientists in Shanghai uh, their P3 lab was shut down uh, after they uh, submitted the first genome sequence to the gene bank and so many of these uh, uh, sensor uh, actions by the CCP government uh, was clearly kind of documented in her uh, communication in the WeChat groups and so that's why uh, her uh, stepping forward to tell the world the truth is very, very important. And what's the most important takeaway from what Yen revealed? What she presented to the world right now, I think, is most powerful is uh, is a uh, malfeasance for the uh, WHO reference lab to not alert the world in a timely way, and also uh, the CCP's cover up about the outbreak and force uh, medical doctors and the scientific researchers to be silenced when they know there's a severe outbreak in Wuhan. The World Health Organization is sending a team to Wuhan, the Chinese city where the CCP virus first emerged, to investigate the origins of the pandemic. But it has not said it will be visiting the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which conducts research and studies into viruses and infectious diseases. The WHO declined to provide details of the places and people its investigators will visit, although it is understood Chinese authorities will monitor all movements. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said he expects the investigation to be completely whitewashed. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo spoke in death to the Economic Club of New York via a webinar. He said he is watching a change among American businesses that are shifting their capital away from Hong Kong since it's lost its autonomy from Beijing. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, speaking in an Economic Club of New York webinar, had a simple request of Beijing to respect the rule of law. Strained relations between the two competing nations are becoming increasingly difficult. The turning point was the virus outbreak. Uh, in China, when the virus broke out in Wuhan, where they attempted at all costs to cause the WHO not to act in the way that was consistent with its requirement. A U.S. investigation determined that the Chinese Communist Party covered up the initial outbreak of the virus at a time when its spread to the rest of the world could have been prevented. The World Health Organization also received criticism for acting in accordance with Chinese officials and delaying the worldwide response. The U.S. has said it is leaving the agency. More than 580,000 people globally have died from the virus. More than 13 million people have been infected since the virus spread from Wuhan. But it's likely more as countries like China and others do not report accurate figures.
And then there is Hong Kong. Pompeo indicated an emerging understanding among the business community about what it might mean to hold capital in a region controlled by the communist regime. We're watching American businesses understand the political risk of operating in places like Hong Kong. And they're seeing that their supply chains are potentially being poisoned by the human rights violations, literally the stain of the century in human rights violations is taking place in Western China today. Beijing imposed its controversial security law in Hong Kong last month, which effectively outlaws criticism of the CCP. The sweeping law brings the region, used to Western freedoms and democracy, more in line with the authoritarian rule of the mainland. A White House National Security Council spokesman said President Trump has not ruled out further sanctions on top Chinese officials for actions in Hong Kong or on other issues. Pompeo noted on Twitter that the president said the U.S. will place a special focus on the admission of Hong Kong residents as refugees. U.S. Attorney General William Barr asks American people and companies to stand together and resist the Chinese Communist Party's attempts at more influence. Eighty percent of federal economic espionage prosecutions link back to the benefit of the Chinese state. Barr says the regime uses a number of predatory and illegal tactics to try to dominate and infiltrate America and ultimately try to replace it as the world's superpower. U.S. Attorney General William Barr expressed a sense of urgency for the American people and companies to stand together and secure Americans' freedoms and prosperity. Barr points out countless espionage, coercion and censorship the Chinese Communist Party has forced upon American soil. A world marching to the beat of the communist China's Chinese drum will not be a hospitable one for institutions that depend on free markets, free trade or the free exchange of ideas. For years, the communist regime has undermined America's free market system. One example, America's dependence on China for medical goods, which led to endangering lives during the virus pandemic. The PRC hoarded the masks for itself, blocking producers, including American companies, from exporting them to other countries that needed it. But it doesn't stop there. The CCP's influence on America's free market system stretches back even further. The U.S. used to be the world's largest rare earth producer, but since the 1980s, the Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated and dominated that industry. It comes at what Barr calls a dangerous risk of dependence, since America relies on China for about 80 percent of all imports. Is America's top supplier accounting for about 80 percent of our imports? The risk of dependence are real. Along with the Communist Party's economic handle, Barr also points out the regime's censorship and entertainment, especially Hollywood. One of many examples is found in an American film, World War Z. The zombie movie's original plot included a virus that started in China, but the director had to cut that part out in hopes of stretching into China's market. And Barr says the Communist Party is censoring ordinary American citizens in everyday life, too. Hollywood is far from alone in kowtowing to the PRC. America's big tech companies have also allowed themselves to become pawns of Chinese influence. He encourages American people and companies to reevaluate their relationship with China. Because he says no one should underestimate the ingenuity of China, Barr says the fundamental character of the regime has never changed and isn't any closer to democracy now than it was during the Tiananmen Square massacre. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Barr also listed a number of more examples, like the CCP hacking virus vaccine research labs and the regime's funded Confucius Institutes, which have popped up around America, with an intention of teaching American students the Communist Party's prescribed history of the Chinese Communist Party. The Trump administration is reportedly considering to ban entrance to the U.S. for all Chinese Communist Party members. An analyst says the U.S. is in for a Cold War fight that might be harder than with the Soviet Union. The Trump administration is reportedly considering to bar Chinese Communist Party members and their families from entering the country. Those who are already in the U.S. could have their visa revoked and be expelled from America if the ban is implemented. The White House has not yet commented on the issue. A China Affair commentator said that by specifically targeting the party, the U.S. could be delegitimizing the communist regime, which is a key component of a Cold War.
The ideological decoupling is an important sign that the new Cold War is already taking shape. The administration last month emphasized the difference between the regime and the Chinese people. Let me make it clear. We have deep respect and admiration for the Chinese people. The United States has a long history of friendship with the Chinese nation. But the Chinese Communist Party does not equal China or her people. The potential ban on travel to the U.S. also reportedly includes members of the Chinese military and executives from state-owned companies. Tang said that would mean U.S.-China communications in the military field will be suspended, and the impact on China's economy would also be huge. If all the high-level management members of the state-owned companies cannot enter the U.S., that basically means these companies can no longer do business here. Chinese state media Global Times said the measure would probably be followed by reciprocal measures from China. But Tang said it will be hard for any countermeasures to be equally effective. Maybe they will ban Americans from entering China or ban U.S. business people from trading in China. But this kind of result might be exactly what the Trump administration wants right now. The administration wants U.S. companies to quickly leave China and come back to the U.S. This is a direction the administration has always been working for. If the CCP really takes such measures, it will be shooting itself in the foot. There are over 90 million Communist Party members in China. Tang said even though many did not join the party wholeheartedly, believing in its ideology, they are still supporting its misdeeds by financial means. Many joined the party for personal interests. We know that under communist rule, if you are a party member, you will have many privileges, like getting promoted. Objectively speaking, although he may not have been involved in aiding and abetting the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party, violating human rights, or committing crimes, his membership is a form of support for it. And by submitting membership dues, you are supporting it financially. Tang said the best way for the Chinese people to avoid sanctions from the U.S. might be to withdraw from the party. Some may be already considering it. Since media reported the potential travel ban for CCP members, Google Trends shows that the search volume of the Chinese word for withdraw from the party has seen a sharp rise. Tang said the U.S. confrontation with the CCP now might be harder and more risky compared to its Cold War with the Soviet Union. At that time, it was a situation where there was a line between the two sides and a clear line of demarcation. So if you wanted to penetrate deeply within the sphere of influence of the other side, it was actually impossible to do so. During the 40 years since establishing a diplomatic relationship with communist China, the U.S. had always seen China as a strategic partner and treated it as a friend. That is to say, in the 40 years, the U.S. was not on guard against the CCP and did not take any precautions. And this is exactly what the CCP has taken advantage of. They have used the openness and freedom of the U.S. to massively infiltrate it. And such infiltration is in all fields. He said examples include the CCP's state media openly broadcasting communist propaganda in the U.S., the use of Confucius Institutes to implement China's censorship onto U.S. campuses, as well as economically by controlling key supply chains of the U.S. like the pharmaceutical industry. More recently, NBA's online store reportedly not allowing fans to print Free Hong Kong on its personalized jersey. The Chinese Communist Party has already reached such a level that it can restrict one of the most basic rights of the American people, one of the most basic rights granted to the American people by the Constitution, which is the right to freedom of speech. No matter how powerful the Soviet Union once was, it didn't manage to reach such a level. He said the U.S. probably needs to do more than what it did with the Soviet Union in order to succeed in this new Cold War. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Analysts had a bit of a surprise this week. Taiwan chipmaker TSMC posted earnings that far surpassed estimates. The company used to be Huawei's number one chip producer. Analysts expected the U.S. ban on Huawei to hurt profits, but it looks like TSMC was able to find clients elsewhere. TSMC confirmed on Thursday a move to stop new orders from Huawei. The company said the decision complies with U.S. export regulations. Apple's main chipmaker raised its outlook for 2020 spending and revenue. It's counting on strong global demand on 5G phones and high-end computing. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., or TSMC, is the world's largest contract chipmaker. It's now projecting more than a 20% growth in sales for the year. 
That's up from an earlier forecast for a rise in the mid to high teens. This week, TSMC reported net income of $4.1 billion for the June quarter. That's up from the $3.8 billion analysts expected. The chipmaker is seen as an industry leader because of its role in crafting silicon for high-powered computers and mobile devices. It signals the future for the rest of the industry. TSMC was the primary chipmaker for Huawei, but hasn't taken any new orders from the Chinese company since mid-May. Analysts expected the U.S. ban on the use of American chipmaking gear for Huawei would be a big blow for profits, but it hasn't been. TSMC's CEO told investors the supply chain will adjust. In order to drive production, TSMC will be increasing investment in factory expansion, and the company will add another $1 billion U.S. dollars for spending on new equipment in its 2020 plan. This will take the budget up to $17 billion U.S. dollars. After learning the value of free speech and democracy, a former Chinese web censor has left the past behind and defected to America. In our exclusive three-part interview, he exposes the inside story of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP's, complex system of Internet censorship and how the regime has been infiltrating the free world. In part three, we'll move on to the CCP's persecution of the spiritual practice Falun Gong. Liu Lipeng worked for Weibo, a Twitter-like Chinese social media app, as a web censor for years. His experience gives a unique understanding why the Chinese people have such a deep-rooted fear of the regime's speech control. Web censors know firsthand how Chinese police use censorship records to arrest and harass people simply for making comments the CCP doesn't approve of. Liu told us that his fellow co-workers don't talk to each other much not even during lunch breaks. CCP censorship reminds you how terrifying talking can be. It makes you worry about the consequence of your words. It makes you feel the fear that CCP constantly trains you to experience. In China, a person must go through strict ID verification in order to upload content online or to video sharing platforms. The applicant is required to take photos of him or herself while holding up both sides of his or her state-issued ID. Liu likened it to mugshots taken of criminals. He says the purpose is to make it easy for local police to find you if you criticize the regime online. He explained that in his eyes, China has become like what George Orwell described in his novels Animal Farm or 1984, where a totalitarian state seeks to control every facet of people's lives. He added that living under that kind of control can even distort Chinese people's personalities. It's like the double thinking George Orwell talked about. People can embrace disruptive behavior out of fear. Even though you don't agree with something, what you say or do could be the opposite. Leo says the CCP censorship and the threats that accompany the censorship have even caused people to self-censor. In order to stay safe and protect themselves and their families, people gradually began to censor themselves. And as time went by, they got used to that way of living. Their ability to look for and recognize the truth became blurred, and they became indifferent to it. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't care whether you agree with it. What they want is for you to fear the barrel of their guns. Leo explained that there are two sensitive phrases the CCP fears most, Tiananmen Square protests and Falun Gong. He told us using them online is absolutely forbidden. Tiananmen Square protest refers to the 1989 democratic movement in Beijing inside Tiananmen Square in the center of Beijing. Chinese soldiers opened fire on unarmed students and citizens and even ran over some of them with tanks. It's estimated that thousands of people were killed, though Chinese communist regime claims no one was killed. The other sensitive phrase refers to Falun Gong, a traditional Chinese spiritual discipline practiced by tens of millions of people around the world. The regime has been persecuting the practice for over two decades and has used its state-controlled media to spread propaganda to defame it. As a result, people who practice Falun Gong have used what limited means were available to combat the disinformation campaign even writing the practice's main principles of truth, compassion and tolerance on banknotes. The persecution of Falun Gong is still going on in China. It's still happening right now. In China, you can find Falun Gong's message on banknotes. Falun Gong is the number one sensitive phrase in China. 
Even mentioning the words Falun Gong has consequences. If you do so online, your account will be deleted immediately. Falun Gong's founding principles of truth, compassion and tolerance are recognized as universal values by the free world, but not the CCP's China. I think there is a criterion, a bottom line to measure the CCP's attitude towards freedom, that is, whether practicing Falun Gong is allowed. Given his 10 years' worth of experience in web censorship and the sharp contrast between the free world and China, our reporter asked Liu if he had any advice for China's current web censors. After silently considering his answer for some time, he had said he'd like to remind the web censors not to sacrifice their human values for a little personal gain. He added that he wants them to understand that freedom is the foundation of all good lives. You are young people. What you see, you use, you like are all products from the free world. If you destroy the free world, where else are you going to go? Web censorship is still tightening in China, and the regime is working to project it to other countries, too. Meanwhile, the West is imposing sanctions to counter Chinese control through apps and the web. Reporting by Wang Ziyi, Xu Wenhui, NTD News. An investigation is underway into the risk posed by two Chinese companies. Both of them hold vast amounts of personal data collected from U.S. teens and others. But social media apps TikTok and WeChat are obliged to hand over their user data at the request of the Chinese regime. The Trump administration is studying the national security risks of two Chinese social media applications. According to a White House official, action is expected in the coming weeks. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said it relates to the gathering of information on American citizens by a foreign adversary. The two apps under scrutiny are TikTok and WeChat. Other apps are being investigated as well. TikTok defended its security practices in a statement, saying, We are fully committed to protecting our users' privacy and security. WeChat owner Tencent did not immediately respond to our request for comment. Republican Senator Josh Hawley put forward a bill that would ban federal employees from using TikTok on government-issued devices. A Senate committee is likely to vote on the bill next week. Hawley has repeatedly raised concerns over TikTok's handling of user data, over worries that it shares the data with the Chinese regime. Several U.S. agencies that deal with national security and intelligence issues have banned employees from using the app. China's foreign ministry spokeswoman denies that there are human rights abuses happening in Xinjiang and says U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo can visit Xinjiang to see for himself. This comes after U.S. sanctions on Chinese officials responsible for the abuses involving Uyghur ethnic minorities in the region in the northwest of China. China is believed to have imprisoned around one million Uyghurs and ethnic minorities in re-education camps in Xinjiang. That's according to leaked documents seen by BBC. In these camps, detainees are locked up and forced to undergo ideological re-education. China's foreign ministry spokesperson also warned the U.S. to take a more friendly approach to relations with China, saying if Washington continues to see Beijing as a threat, it will become self-fulfilling. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.